Hi, my name's Ella McChrystal. Welcome to The New Mind. Today's guest is my very good friend, Scott McKenzie. Now, Scott's come all the way over from New York today to be on the show, so I just want to thank him first. Hi, Scott. Peace, Queen. <laughs> How are you? I'm fine as wine. How are you doing? I'm very well. Now, I, I must also let people know of your, your, your new alias or nickname which is sugar daddy scotty yes okay and that's how people can actually find you on instagram as well isn't it yep sugar daddy scotty tv uh yeah that's insane yeah. why why are we why are we sugar daddy scotty tv my friend who's actually um bob marley's granddaughter she we me, me and her for years always just had like a a playful relationship we never did nothing sexual and we just have that type of relationship yeah. and it, i always take care of her and stuff so she was she called me sugar daddy scotty she said it one time i said i like that <laughs> i'm gonna keep i'm gonna use that and then <laughs> i was playing with it for a while and then yeah i was like you know what I, it I'm gonna go with it. Uh, then i went on fiverr and got the logo done aha uh -huh. as a joke uh -huh. and then i was like i like the logo <laughs> yeah, right, it's I'm quite cool with this well, also, it's good colors. I'm I'm down with the purple, yeah. so you know that. I've got it all around us. So yeah. I, I love I love the fact that you've got this, because I actually met Scott as great Scott McKenzie. Yes. So, uh, you can still call me that. Yeah, I'm, gonna, I'm still going to call you that, because that's how I know you. You're still great Scott to me. You always will be. Now, uh, Scott's a very good friend of mine, and yes. I always say to Scott, you're like family to me. Yes, ma'am. Uh, because we've had some deep, deep conversations. Yeah, cause yeah. The reason for that is Scott is number one, like this pop psychologist. And he's, <sighs> he's I've, I've said it before, he's a like, cultural guru for me. I'm, I'm not that cool. Uh, but Scott tells me stuff that keeps me down with the kids. So I always <laughs> love talking to Scott because it keeps me really relevant and fresh. I have a 15 year old daughter, so that's really yeah. important to know what's going on in that kind of space. But also you're just really interesting. You retain information uh, like no one else. You've got this photographic memory for really interesting stuff, but you're also really entrepreneurial and you're in this kind of business space doing so many different things. And I kind of wanted to just share you with the world because, quite frankly, for me, you've been such an inspiration. I wouldn't have written my book had you not have said, Ella, why don't you write a book? And I was like, me? And then I wrote a book because you suggested it. Like, okay. Truly, like some of the stuff you were saying to me about. And then obviously, um, recently as well, I had my uh, my therapy method mm -hmm. trademarked and registered and again that really was something that i learned from you like yeah. own everything because when you own everything mm. you're in charge of your own life that's right um so i owned property i owned the clinic that we're sitting in now the studio that's right. and uh, but then scott made me realize about the digital side of things like own everything yeah. so this is why scott's here because one he's got an, some amazing stories that you won't actually believe some of the stories coming from this guy but also like a real kind of i don't want to say rags to riches but that kind of you yeah. know elevation yeah. yeah and also just just some of the stuff you know the cultural yeah. stuff the music industry so on so forth so we're gonna have a great time today yes right so great scott tell me about great scott first so we know sugar daddy scotty now but yeah. what tell me about great scott where's that come from okay um I was born in Newark, New Jersey. My mother was born in England, mm -hmm. um, but left at like four years old. My grandmother told me um, before she died, she told me that Hitler, they thought Hitler was going to take over England. So they took a boat to back to America, uh, to America. And, and then um, my mom met my father. I'm born during the crack era, 1985 AC after crack. <laughs> and the crack the crack era nice. was a was a big deal um my family everybody was either selling it or doing it so my father's side was mainly on drugs and then my mother's side was you know robbers murderers rapists all types of stuff and then um it just it was just crazy but you know it's, it's our normal at that time um but pablo escobar was really running the world at that time and then um as that is doing his thing Hip hop is emerging at that time, and um, I'm only 20 minutes from New York. But in general, um, like back in the day, uh, Tupac used to be around because the Outlaws are from where I'm from. I was I was born in Newark, but raised in East Orange, New Jersey. They're from the Oranges. There's Newark, East Orange, South Orange, and then um, 
Eminem. He used to be out there a lot too. Um, so as you're growing up, all these people are basically all around you. Is this what you're saying? Yes, yeah. yes, yes, yes. And and then I lived down the street from the Fugees as they were recording their first album back in the day. Um, American blacks were like racist towards immigrant blacks. So if you were J Haitian, Jamaican, I'm Jamaican, and uh, Haitians, Jamaicans, and um, and Africans, they used to call at the Africans. Um, African booty scratcher and for all my people that know HBO Haitian body odor. So we all stuck together. That's how we met Wyclef's side and his yeah. families and stuff. And then um, they were recording the score and stuff and killing me softly blew up. I mean, there's more to it, but long story short, killing me softly blows up. They become a big thing. And this is my first take of what the outside world looks like outside of New York, New Jersey. Yeah. So they're down the street. They've recorded this phenomenal album that everybody's heard of, or at yeah. least most people have heard of it. And you're kind of around them as they're as they're building this profile and building their their yeah. well, it's not even fame, is it? But it is, but it was they were cultural icons at the time. There was something really different about them and fresh about them at that point in time. Well, hip hop was blowing up low key. Um, and I, I'm skipping some stuff, like example, during that little time too, my mother was uh, a dancer. She used to be a dancer. Puffy, Puff Daddy, P Diddy, Sean Combs, he started off as a dancer. Yeah. And they met in clubs. But while she's dancing, she also became a model because back then casting directors would look for um, my, look for people to be in music videos in the club. Yes. And then she got booked. And then they would say, oh, do you know people bring them to the video shoot? Uh -huh. And then that turned to her being like, well, if I'm doing your job, I might as well take your job and become a casting director myself. Yes. But within all that, Puffy's at Uptown and he's with Andre Harrell. And then he has Biggie. He has Craig Mack. He has, um, I forgot who else, Heavy D, all these artists back in the day. And then he got fired. And then he said, look, I'm going to start my own stuff, you know. Who want to come with me? And my mom was like, let's go. I'm with you. I'm with Bad Boy. Let's do it. And then he got um, a deal with Arista Records and Clive Davis. Clive Davis discovered Whitney Houston. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Many people. Anyway, then um, my mom became the casting director of Biggie Small's One More Chance. That was her first paying casting job. And um, one, yeah, Biggie Small's One More Chance. And then, and then she worked with Bad Boy for like, even after Biggie's death, everything. And then, um, and she also worked at Death Row. So anyway, you know, back then it was, of course, a much smaller community because it was in the beginning stages. Yeah, yeah. So everybody knew everybody. And I yeah. was just a young kid around all this stuff, not really understanding what I'm around either because, you know, it's not, it's not until hindsight, like 20, 30 years later, we look back at those times, like now they're making movies about it. Well, yeah, because you're just a kid as well. So as a child, like this is just your norm. You're, you, these people around you, you know, they're doing something, but you can't, you know, we can't understand that fully as children. We just go with the flow. We we understand there's something maybe a bit special about these people because the way they talk or the way they act or whatever. But now these are icons. These are people that will always go down in history as the best of the best. Yes. So you are growing up really seeing these people, experiencing these people on some level, and your mum is working with them and, and chilling with them and hanging yeah. out with them. So that just gives you a whole different, as an adult anyway, a whole different perspective on life. It doesn't matter that, you know, that wouldn't necessarily have been the most financially rewarding time because the things that you're picking up, mm. the mindset that you're mm. you're observing and, and absorbing is obviously going to then shape who you become as an adult. Yeah. Um, so talk about the great Scott thing, actually. So oh, your dad's. Yeah. No, it's OK. I'm good at this stuff. This is what therapy is all about, weaving it all in. Not that you're having therapy, but you know yeah. what I mean? It's what I do. So we go back to. Uh, the great Scott thing, because your dad, uh, you know, like you say, he met your mum at, at that point in time, that crack era, but he didn't stick around, did he? Yes. Yeah, so, yes. Yeah, so, so she told me, well, I spoke to him too. I found him later in life. Um, they had a two year relationship. They were only 16, 17. And then um, she got pregnant and he didn't want a baby. And she said she didn't either. She said, the only reason I had you is because I didn't have enough money for an abortion. Wow. She's just being honest. <laughs> yeah. So boom. And then I was born. And then when I found him, I got his side of the story. Yeah. He said he was stressed out. A baby was a big responsibility. He was a kid. He didn't. Yeah. He was a kid and, and, and he didn't want to be involved and he just left in the middle of the night and she never heard from him again. Wow. At that time. And his name was also Scott McKenzie, right? Well, yeah. When, when she met him, yeah, his name was Scott Spears. Ah, Scott Spears. Um, because I got her last name. 
I see. Um, Sorry. Yeah. My bad. No, it's okay. Because yeah, people always be like, why you, got, why you got your mother's last name? Yeah, his, but he kept changing his name a lot. And she told me, like, she always found that, like, like he had an identity crisis. She felt. Ah, okay. Because he changed his name, like, four times. And in the times that I would sporadically find him, it was always a new name. Wow, that's interesting. For that reason. Actually, I never asked him why he, he always did that. Well, yeah. what we do know is that you you uh, took on the name Great Scott because yeah. there's you wanted to be greater uh, than my father. Yeah, Scott. yeah. And, and Later that, in life, I took that name. Yeah, that's right. And so we 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 meet at the time when you're using the name Great, Great Scott, Scott on yeah. on social media, and you were you were really I don't even know how many years ago it was now. Probably like twelve, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, maybe even years ago now that we met actually on social media yeah you were managing uh michael k williams account at the time yeah. michael k williams is from the wire he yeah. played omar he was in um various different things 12 yeah. years a slave he had a small part in that he yeah. was also in when they see us he was yeah. also in lots yeah. of other things and he was a dancer as well wasn't he he'd met yes. your mother mom, that way yeah. 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 So you were working for Michael K. Williams, who's sadly no longer with us. And Tupac discovered him. Tupac discovered him. So, yeah, I His mean. His first film was, um, oh, I forgot the name. Tupac was in so much movies. But he's in a scene with Pac. Uh, I can't remember this film right now. Anyway, yeah. Wow. Tupac discovered him and gave him his first opportunity. But in the mix, my mother, too, everybody. So she's meeting involved. all these people. And then you're, you end up either working with these people being friends with these people and 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 having like some kind of connect with these people later on as well um so as a young boy then um your mum must have been working quite a lot because that industry isn't like your nine to five go to the office no. finish so what does that mean for you as a young boy growing up well yeah my mom was always on tour or, or just on the road my grandmother really raised me most of those times but that was good for me because i i i I have a different level of respect for like female entrepreneurship. Yeah. Maybe like some men, especially like within girlfriends, they want the woman home, cook, clean. Of course. Especially more back then. So no, I, I believe women are as equal to men and, and, and you can especially make money more, more money than men because um, at that time, you know, it was mainly men making most of the money. Yeah. 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 Even I mean, in the business. Of course. She but, was doing something completely different, really I, raising you alone. I don't want to tell her, her business i think though her day rate like starting was three thousand dollars nice which was really good for the 90s yeah um and now to be honest yeah definitely now too yeah yeah i don't, I don't know what cast and directors get now but um back then because she did the dave Chappelle show she did um she did a few movies and a few tv shows but notorious is one yes um the os the, the blind side which won an oscar she did she did that as well she casted the principal football player for sandra bullock wow wow so, wow wow you know. and she she did she cast for the wire as well N no right um she that, just knew everybody from she the just wire. knew it's just like it's a small community everybody knew everybody so the wire for me and yeah. i know that you know quite a few yeah. personally know quite a few people from that show i know like, most of the black people. yeah <laughs> yeah all of the black people yeah. not most of them <laughs> no i don't know it yourself but i never met him all oh, right okay but, but personally i have a relationship with like tristian jermaine especially the kids by season four um, and Michael B. Jordan, of course. Actually, I never met Michael B. Jordan. But my, he, my he started there. Don't know him. Yes, he did. Yeah. But so, we don't know him. No, which is which is a shame. But he's from my city. I know he is. Yeah. So if you ever meet him, I'm the first to know. <laughs> no, my, maybe my mom met him, but I, I don't. I've never met him. Before. No. Well, the thing is, is that whichever way you look at it, Sorry, that yeah. show was the best. Apart from there's two, well, three Oz which some people oh, may never man. have seen. Yeah, I love um, that. That show for me is one of my all-time favorites, The Wire yeah. and obviously Breaking Bad as well, which is nothing mm. to do with, with you necessarily. But those three shows for me will always, yeah. always, always, always be the best three shows of all time. But The Wire for me, I think it just... Um, just pulled at every single heartstring it just got me in every single way and then when we started talking and you know i knew that you were so involved with these people i was like yes. who is this guy uh, and and actually there's so much more to you than that because your mind from all these experiences and all these people is so different and that's why i say cultural guru because you've had these different people around you which does give you this different impression and like you say your mum's away touring so you're brought up by your grandmother which means that i think you were is it fair to say very self-sufficient from a very young age 
Yes, because of the training. I mean, most people, one of your podcasts, you were talking about not beating kids, but yeah, <laughs> I mean, I'm I'm Caribbean in our culture, they beat the kids. But I think that, um, yeah, my mom was really brutal. Like when I first would come to New York at 12, let's say like 10, 11, 12, the one specific time she just left me. Her thing was like, I'm not repeating myself to you. You know, my mom's training was like um Ray Charles when Jamie Foxx played Ray. And the mother knew the child was going blind. Yeah. And she was like, you know, the world is not going to be um soft on you. It's going to yeah. be even harder because you're blind. I don't know if you remember the movie. Yeah. And he would have flashbacks like when it came to like the money. And that's yeah. why he would always went in singles because people were still. And the mother was training him for that. And 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 that's needed, especially when you grow up in the hood. And like The Wire is the real reality of Baltimore. Maybe one day you'll go and see. Yeah, it yeah. It still is like that. Yeah. You know, and has changed. You know, Baltimore, Detroit. Compton, uh, parts of Miami, um, of course, Newark, Philly. These are like treacherous Chicago. Yeah. They're number one like treacherous, um, hoods. And, um, I grew up in that, you know, being in the projects and stuff. And, but that's why i I grow with hip hop and the music business and stuff, because this was like the first industry that, that it made billionaires. It made, you can be a millionaire overnight. And that's why everybody's I'm, I'm not a rapper I'm, I'm the executive side of stuff yeah media executive that's really important to say actually that I've introduced you with the nickname first and actually we yeah. should probably say you are a media executive as well we're talking about you know your history and the people that you're around and the reality of life for you at that point mm. and that actually what you've carved out for yourself is a completely different well for most people listening mm. a completely different way of life mm. most people listening are going to have their own kind of uh, creativity or business ideas or whatever, but you've kind of done so much, which is what is so interesting about you. And, and, and again, I said earlier about your mind, you just absorb information. You've got this photographic memory. And when I visited New York and, and, you know, Scott's kind of walked me around the streets of New York, he's like, he tells me a million facts about each part of New York because he just retains information. He's, he's, he's like a historian and he should be like, the best tour guide ever but that's no that's no disrespect it's because you know everything about everything um and and i think that you know looking at you growing up and having quite a harsh experience but like you know you say culturally very normal you you become quite resilient and quite tough and quite self-sufficient early on as a result of the way that your mum had to parent you as at, at that point in time, mm. she's touring a lot. She's a single parent and she's basically saying to you, Scott, this is reality. You've got to get with the program and I'm not, I haven't got the time to repeat myself to you. So you've yeah. got to learn and you've got to learn quick. Yeah. So at that point, you know, are you sort of taking yourself to school? Are you having to do things on your own at a time? And it may yeah. be in a space where it wasn't always safe to do so. Yeah. So I'm, I'm an only child and um, school was like prison. And, you know, my, my first my first day of high school, I went to East. I went to the original East Orange High School and um, I seen a teacher get thrown out of class. I seen these students jump a teacher. That was just day one. And then I seen like um, when I was growing up, the Bloods and the Crips were just becoming like a, a nation thing it, 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 it wound up growing out of, out of california because suge knight would come to different places every story you hear about him is true yeah he would come to different places and he was like um like like putting in the brains of young black kids you know you, you want to do all this gang stuff whatever anyway so i wanted to escape that and that's why i started being next to the fujis and how I wanted to get into businesses. One day I was sitting at the Booger basement and the, the CEO of Sony Music came. I don't know if this is the day they got signed. I don't know. I know he, he this white man came in a limousine and back in the day, limousines was a big thing. <laughs> yeah. And we were playing pick my car on the porch. And then next thing you know, I was like, oh, this limousine is coming back here. We ran to the backyard. Wow. And I said, I got to ask this guy what he do. He must have a lot of money. <laughs> and I said, excuse me, sir, what do you do for a living? He said, I'm the CEO of my own company, kid. <laughs> like smoking a big cigar, very stereotypical, like yeah. executive looking thing. And I said, can I sit in your limousine? He said, sure. And he told the driver, give me a Pepsi and stuff. And I said, I don't know what a CEO is, but I'm going to be one because <laughs> we got a limousine. This is Love fabulous. It. And he's driving in the hood in a limousine. So anyway, that, that, that parlayed me into the, into like the start. So going back to now high school and stuff, after school, I would go to New York by myself, catch the bus. I go to New York and just walk around, just try to get in something, you know? And it took me maybe like four years before I developed any relationships. I'm getting taller. Yeah. And that's how I started. I started modeling. 
a stylist, a GQ stylist, but I, I didn't do GQ. She, um, she, I was just walking down the street. She's like, oh, I need a model for, for a shoot tomorrow. It was for a Japanese magazine. And this is how I parlayed into Pharrell. And then, um, boom. Just dropping it in there. Just Pharrell. No big deal. I'm sorry. Yeah, I started <laughs> working on Pharrell Williams. You know, y'all know him for Happy. The, I, I didn't realize how popular that Happy song was. Oh, over here, it's ridiculous. Well, well, even he has, as he said in an interview recently, how most people don't know him for nothing in the past. Well, NERD is how I, I knew Pharrell. Me too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. No, yeah. That's all, like. De demolished it's happy yeah <laughs> <That's>, <laughs> yeah but, but yeah but yeah so I, I modeled for this magazine and then that that oh and i was also working at radio city music hall which is f f if no one's been to new york you, if this yeah. one of the things that you'll always you'll definitely see over and over again yeah radio city music hall and Madison square garden both owned by the same person yeah bob dolan and his parent company is called cable vision and that's how i would start doing production with Master Square Garden and then Radio City. Because sometimes if Master Square Garden was short of staff, they uh -huh. would send us to Master Square Garden. So, so you're starting off uh, modeling. You get you get scouted on the street because you're this handsome guy mm. walking around trying to make his way. Yeah. Someone says, whoa, this is a beautiful man. I yeah. want you for a shoot. You have this shoot. Yeah. And then this is your first kind of, ooh, I, I could do something here. School's a bit rubbish. So I'm walking around trying to find my way. Yeah. Modeling comes up. Yeah. And this is the beginning of you then getting the doors opening or, or opening the doors yourself, probably having yeah. to fight quite hard to Radio City Hall and Madison Square Garden. Yeah. And so this is where your brain, you've had this experience in the living zine. You, school's not great, probably quite violent, whatever. Not whatever, but you know what yeah, I mean. Yeah. Uh, you are then scouted, opening doors, boom, we're into yeah. a different way of life. So you've experienced a different way of life to begin with. And now you've got a taste of that as a small child. So now you want more. Yeah. And New York was showing me more. And New York wasn't, nobody judges anybody. Nobody cared. Um, I, I mean, to, to show you the violence in my school, I witnessed a gang member stick his knife up somebody's rectum. Wow. And rip him up to his neck. And that was a regular day in my I school. I mean, that's 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 insane. And, and there's worse What stories. does that do to you when you see that? Like, How old are you at that point? This is high school, 14, 15, 16. And I, mean, I mean, for me, if I mm. see that, that that's trauma mm. without a shadow of a doubt. Clinically, that yeah. is trauma. For you, is that just kind of like, oh, well, that's just another day at school? Well, when you're in it, it's very normal, yeah, because you're so used to that type of violence in the hood all the time. Um, when I first got with my girlfriend, right, I told her about a gang in our in my town. It was It was called FBI. It stands for Female Bitches Incorporated. I know that sounds so stupid, <laughs> and it is stupid. Um, <laughs> but these women, they they killed men. You know, they killed people. And I never forget they stabbed my friend. I was with him. We were walking in the hallway, and um, it was it's like it was like prison. Like they they literally caught him so fast, he didn't even catch it. And next thing you know, we looked at him, we saw him go, blah, 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 and he just and then he put his hands on the wall, and all the blood was on the wall. He's like, oh snap! And they throwing up their gang sign, and they run. And then I seen per in person another time the FBI, they um, slit this girl's throat. She beat a girl in a fair fight. And then they, you know, they, they grab her from behind, choke out, grab her arms. And then the girl that she beat up, they gave her the razor. Because back in those days, they used to do a thing called the buck. They still do it. Called the buck 50. You take a razor and you slice somebody from the, like Michael K. He yeah, actually, yeah, he yeah. He got a buck 50. Yeah. He got two because they had slit, slit his throat. Yeah. But he's but... so dark, you can't see that. Yes. And then they slit his face. Yeah. Yeah, so they they slit her throat. And I mean, they, they grabbed her, by the, the the girl who got beat up went, and then she. I remember when she came back to school, she survived it. Then that scar was crazy, and I just I felt so sad for her because she was so beautiful. But let me just pause here. This is so, what I mean. Um, no, don't apologize. Yeah. But I'm pausing here for a reason because I introduce you and I say this guy's got so many stories. Mm -hmm. Like we've only just started, oh, yeah. and we're <laughs> talking about superstars. We're talking about you know murders. We're talking about. Pharrell, yeah. this is this is what I mean about Scott, everyone. Like this guy has had a lot of very varied, multifaceted experiences in life. And this is before he's even really got into the world of media exec that he is now. Like we are talking about just severe trauma. Oh yeah. But yeah. you're but you're you're quite disassociated from it, I think, because again, it's a day to day thing yeah. for you at that point in time. And if you don't if you don't carry on and just keep your head up and just keep going, then you're gonna you're gonna fall, you're gonna crack. And so you 
was there a time, Scott, where witnessing all these things, the, the contrast as well. And I know, I know that we know like Suge Knight, you referenced there and Tupac and Biggie, and yeah. there was always something going on there in terms of violence or whatever. We know you were around these people and seeing this world, but then you're seeing this contrast of just people getting stabbed up, people getting this, you know, yeah. throat slit. What, what does that do to your mind? I mean, don't get me wrong. I understand that resilience is a very wonderful yeah. tool, but there's a level <laughs> where it's kind of like, is this a bit too much for someone to cope with? What happened to you? How did you, how did you keep going? What was the thing that you, I guess, pulled on? You know that strength or that 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 passion. How did you keep going with all of that? Well, off my head, so w- within the Fujis, I grew up more with Y class family. Yeah, and I always looked at his family as an escape from all of it. Because you're still friendly with him now, aren't you? Yeah, like, yeah, the still whole family. A, yeah, I went when he moved to a better part of life, I would do my best to like always want to sleep at his house or yeah. Jerry Wonder's house or um, Renel Duplessis house, somebody else's house, but just not, not be in my area. Cause my area was bad. My, my home was bad. I mean, I got, yeah, I, it's not even stories. It's, it's just such a reality for everybody. Cause I've been kidnapped. I've been molested, all this stuff, whatever, but I'm not unique. Um, most of my family died of AIDS and my father's side died of AIDS cause from sharing needles. Uh huh. But, all my friends, they lost their parents, everything during those times. But this is and collective so, trauma. Yeah, so that's what I'm kind of saying. Like this, this, this experience that you're having is collective trauma. You, you mentioned the crack era at the start. And, you know, this, this was a, a, a norm, like you say, it was a normality. It was a reality and it was day to day for everybody. But it is collective trauma. And so within collective trauma, there are behaviors and adaptions that the brain makes and then cultural norms that that are are created, I guess, out of that collective trauma. And I suppose it's only with this is why these conversations are so important because it's only when you start to look at other people's lives as you get a bit older and you go, "What? Mm. You didn't see any violence. You didn't experience abuse at all. You know, you didn't have to to get yourself to school. You didn't have to witness someone at school being stabbed up in front of you. You didn't get kidnapped. You didn't get molested. What? You know? And then people are like. Yeah, actually, Scott, although that's your reality, in relative terms, it is not normal. <laughs> but uh, what yeah. is? And that's the question, is it? This is why this podcast showcases so well, because we're looking at everybody's life so far and we'll continue to do so. And there's no such thing as normal, but we are all human and we all need to hear each other and understand each other and, yeah. and be there for each other. So, so you're living this crazy normality, reality, collective trauma. Well, I want to well, say... You know, I just I'm as I travel, right? And I've been to Mexico, and I'm from Jamaica, and um, you've traveled a lot. I've traveled a lot. You've done Europe a lot as well, haven't you? Greece, yeah, yeah, yeah. Amsterdam, all sorts. I've been to Palestine. And yeah. Stuff. Oh, yeah, and you have. Yeah. I want to say, like, example, like in Mexico, their violence is. I, I could think I went through stuff, but their violence is another level, especially yes. with the cartels. Yes. My girl has had her cousins beheaded and the head melt to the mother. Anything you see like on Netflix, Narcos and all that, that is not over exaggerated. They're 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 actually my girl's um brother in law works at the Pentagon and they said um and this was more when ISIS was doing all that production yeah, of burning yeah. people alive and stuff. They said that um I all the terrorists learn how to do what they do from the cartel wow. that's how much the cartel influences yeah just some um, um interrogations and yes. stuff like that so i was like and and yeah he he was he goes in more about like ecuador and el salvador and south america brazil these yeah. places are all dangerous you know but sometimes you know i i've come to terms where people live either you haven't been through too much of that or you've been through a lot of that yeah i, I very rarely meet somebody in the middle yeah of that type of no matter where you're from because in chicago is is every day and we talking about kids kids killing kids well, you, yeah you've referenced chicago often to me we're as like, like so violent 40 murders a day on average yeah like every day every i mean day. that's just it's mind-blowing for someone from a little old town northampton mm. you know not far from london but still it's it's and you know we were talking actually as you came in weren't we saying there's been three three knife 
crime murders in Northampton of, of, of late. And we were saying, oh my gosh, this is crazy for Northampton. This is awful. And Someone is. was just killed last night. But for you, what are the, the places you've visited and the experiences you've had, again, not actually that abnormal. So it is all relative to your experience. And that's why I talk about that collective trauma, because I think it's really important to reference that and to see how those cultural norms are developed yeah. as a result of that. And this is why we're all so different in the terms of cognitive biases. You know, that our psychology is very different as a human race because we've all had these different experiences. And I think it's so important to just hear people just let people explain their stories, understand that it doesn't matter where you're from and what the experiences are. We need to hear each other. We just need to be really open yeah. and understand that things like racism, things like misogyny, things like sexism, you know, whether it's uh, things like dis disability as well, we have to hear each other. And people are just so angry with each other in the world right now because obviously we're, we're post COVID and, um, you know, there's a lot of poverty in, in, in certainly in the UK and I'm sure definitely in America. Uh, and so everyone's quite angry. You know, the governments are just full of buffoons. You know, we, we, we have people leading our countries that are just not fit to lead a flipping corner shop, let alone a country. Um, and, you know, with Biden losing his memory or mm -hmm. mind, Trump is another story we've got rishi who's probably better than boris well definitely better than boris boris is a clown mm. and we've got rishi who's stepped in and still not doing much better our nhs is crumbling your your situation with healthcare and stuff in america is diabolical so everyone's angry but then but then listening to your story so far i'm like oh my god we haven't even got into the juicy bits you know yeah. mind you being kidnapped and molested is fairly juicy but you know what i mean we yeah. haven't even got into the biggest part of your adult life yet so yep you are kidnapped and molested yeah those things have happened and people have died i, I had a friend recently not recently this was years ago but he was found in half cut in half wow um but that's just the nature of the street life. I'm in. I'm not in it. But you, you, you're guilty by association. That's yes. why somebody came at me more than once, and I've I've had home invasions. They are real. Actually, I still suffer from that. That's why I can't sleep. I still can't sleep. Properly. When you talk about home invasions, for those listening that don't know what a home invasion yeah. is, just to explain that a little bit for well, me. Well, home invasions, to be clear, in the in the America, is normally like a West Coast thing, right? Because just the way their houses are formatted, like in LA and stuff, like. It's just more simpler to do it over there. That's not really where I'm from, but during the drug era and my uncle, I told you my uncles are murderers and stuff, whoever they had killed, um, those people wanted revenge. They kidnapped a few people. I wasn't the only one. Yeah. Um, and thank God nobody told or, or anything, you know? Um, but, but yeah, and in this case, it was a home invasion. The door got kicked in, tied me and my granny up. And, and I wasn't the only kid that went through this. A lot of kids went through this. Uh, how old were you at the time? Uh, probably 12. Oh my gosh. But it's, listen, I'm, I'm so grateful. I don't know if you've ever seen Paid in Full. No. It's Cameron, Mackay Pfeiffer, and um, Wood Harris. Wood Harris played Avon. Right. And, uh, and long story, that's based on a true story. Yeah. And the point is that when I watched that film, when it came out in what, 2000, and they killed that boy, and they, they I don't know if you, you say you didn't see it, but they, they started, and this, this really happened, they cut the finger off and then they melted to the, to one of the characters and then they cut his hand off and then wow. they cut, and, and they was telling them yeah you could find his hand in in this mcdonald's in harlem there's a i watched that scene like that could have been me yeah i'm so grateful and his own uncle killed him wow. because he knew that the nephew had money and he just wanted the money and that was his little brother that's his that's his uncle that's how treacherous things are you know but i won't go to what you said about the world being mad and as i've gotten older i always i feel like life is like the matrix in the sense of like you're Neo, and, and as you get older, you, you get exposed to the truth because it's all smoke and mirrors. It's all yes. a bunch of BS from, yeah. in, in every aspect of life. You know? Yeah. Um, but what what I've came to terms with is like, how do I show people the dark arts of, of, of livelihood? Because, you know, it's it's all it's all a lie. And, and, and that's there for a reason to keep you down, however we want to look at it. Um, and you have to do your best to... Um, learn how to play this game of chess you know actually it's not even chess it's really monopoly and um if you understand that you will survive so where did you learn that so where did you start to think 
okay, I've got to play this game of Monopoly now. Because obviously, again, your exposure is slightly different to some people, of course, but uh, in childhood, but you you start to realize I'm gonna I'm gonna learn how to navigate this system here. Mm. I'm gonna I'm gonna get these jobs and because you're working in Radio City Hall and you're you're doing some stuff at Madison Square the Gardens and you referenced Pharrell earlier. Yeah. Okay, so how how did you work for Pharrell for his brand? So to give time reference, I'm 37 now. Yeah, and then I worked with Pharrell like around 20 when I was like 20. There's like 2006, seven, eight, nine, ten those years yeah and at this point you know he was just blowing up um like i'm skipping a lot of my story but i got an internship with billionaires boys club the fashion line and then that is that his yeah that's his fashion fashion line line. okay with his partner nigo nigo owned bay the nape at the time for those who are in fashion i know and then um that i I wanted to be next to him because i knew he was going to change the landscape of fashion especially not just for hip-hop but the culture the category of fashion is he one of the first men in music at that level to start looking at fashion? Or was there was there people before that were doing big brands, you know, hip hop stars, music stars of, of that era? So to me, he's the first to up the taste levels of it because okay. Billionaires Boys Club was selling for so much money. Now you the average at least in America, the average kid is wearing a thousand dollar shoes, a thousand dollar t shirt. Yeah. You know, and that's regular to them. Yeah. Not back in my day, but Pharrell was the start of that. Pharrell was on Richard Milley and and Ardo Mars and stuff before it was cool. And yeah, he, there's videos to prove it. Yeah, um, and there is no Virgil at Louis Vuitton without Pharrell Correct. opening that yeah, door. Yeah, because he was the first to collab with Virgil. Those high end brands went would collab with no rappers back in the day. Yeah, yeah. You know, Dapper Dan. I don't know if you know Dapper Dan yeah. from Harlem. He he got a cease and assist. He he said he lived underground because you know they tried to lock him up. Yeah. Um, Fendi and all these brands. So Pharrell was able to set the spark the seed. And now look, Domino Effect, years later, he's he just got hired as the creative director. It's um, cr- that crazy. was announced like two months ago, and June will be his first fashion show. Cause you know, Virgil passed away. Yes. So, with all that being said, like I want to be with Pharrell because I saw just like the Fuji's, I was like, nah, this this guy's gonna take this game to another level and open the doors. And and that's how we help change the madness and all the craziness going on in the world is like, how do we get with people and, par- and partner with an Ella, partner with whoever that can make this world a better place and not. Um, so you're, you're in at the, the beginnings, not necessarily the, the beginning, beginning with Pharrell, but certainly at the, the first. With the fashion brand. I'm with the fashion brand, yeah. yeah. So you are there seeing this new wave actually happen in front of your eyes. And you're on, uh, there's pictures of you in various different places, but you know, you, you've you done a lot of uh, modeling from that that era as well and actually scott what was this what's up uh, <laughs> everything's having it all at the same yeah, time the so same time. it might seem like me like the modeling pharrell because when i was for us i had four jobs i still was working at radio city music hall another place named kid robot and uh, i can't remember the other one. but I, you were I, I you were busy jobs. you were just, you were just, entrepreneurial you saw that you had to be well, fingers in all pies yeah somebody could be a bartender and I mean, in, in New York, everybody's just doing everything. Whatever you can to so just... I said, my mother's literally working at Bad Boy. Because you're an independent contractor to an extent. Yes. Bad Boy, Death Row, and then still doing like jobs like Britney Spears and stuff. And it all just works the way it works. It's hard to explain because New York is like that. Yeah, it's just different. It's a different Everybody just different do everything. Vibe, yeah. Everybody's just trying to hustle. They're not even hustle. It's like, you know, just in the culture. and That's how it works. It, it could be a random day. <laughs> because, and, and and so then, you know, you've got all these exposures. And I know that what we're doing now actually this podcast you were kind of doing stuff like this i've seen clips on on youtube old clips and you were being interviewed sitting on a bench outside somewhere with someone yeah. you were always in this space like that media space was kind of what you did and what you knew um and then so you work with pharrell you're doing all this stuff radio city hall and you're you're fingers in pies so what's the next step for you and, and kind of what at that point in your 20s, yeah. what have you taken from those harsh experiences as well as from this taste of this life, this media life mm. that you love so much? What what kind of lessons have you learned at that point? Because in your 20s, we're still babies at that age. Yeah, definitely. So the, so I was a part of the unintentionally the early days of being a social media influencer. Yeah. While I'm working for Rel. You know, it's tons of opportunities that came with them. Yeah. And then um and working with Michael K. Williams yes. and stuff. 
So uh, MySpace, the end of MySpace yes. turned into Facebook was that's coming right. out. That's right. That's right. And then um, companies were paying me to like per post. Like yeah. I was getting ninety dollars per post. Yeah. And I mean, now this kid's getting like sixty thousand, seventy thousand. Yeah, but nobody was doing that then. Like you were one of the first to be doing that kind a of stuff. Part of those kids, yeah. Yeah. Because um, I was also a stylist. So because I was the next to like Kid Cudi, Wale, Tiana Taylor, who's now a movie star. Um, I'm trying to think, what's popping back now? Um, all these acts that were coming up. I wound up being next to them and brand saw that and was like, so Reebok became a sponsor. I wound up doing marketing for Reebok and then they would just give me like a monthly retainer to give out free clothes. Cause yeah, I remember you were just giving stuff away for yeah. free. I was like, how do you even get into a space where you're giving stuff away for free? But obviously that's how it, again, it's, it's going on now on social yeah. media much, much more, but th that was not really well known at the time. That kind of thing you were again at the beginning of that kind of movement. Yes. Well, so I, it's not nobody's fault. We all, I was young and they were living their life, but as I got older and I understand how business works, I'm like, wow, I'm being taken advantage of. You know, yeah. People were like intellectual property. I, I heard that term through Reebok because they bought some intellectual property I created with somebody named Wayno. And I was like, what the hell does that mean? Like, I never heard that term before. But so everybody was like, get this kid around because he's going to bring the next kids around. Like I had a show with MTV. Um, it, it wound up not coming out on air, but on that show, um, Rigi, Rigi was on that show. Now he has one of the biggest fashion brands right now. Like, like literally one of the biggest. And I was like, you know, I was with him. I was with him back in LA, like 2010 when he was nobody. We wow. were just all young kids coming up. But I, I was like, damn, that's what they always wanted me around. Like Puffy and all of them. They were like, yeah, bring him here. So he could bring in another, all the other kids. Here. Yeah. Get our product on them. And yeah. Whatever. Not knowing I could have just started a whole agency, signed all these people myself. So you're being used and, as like a, a mannequin, really. Like you're showcasing a lot of this stuff for people for free, which all of us, yeah. Which now you would be getting paid a lot of money for. <laughs> yeah, if, if I if I knew the game better, but yeah. that was the start of the dark arts. Just how like people leeches and use you because once I had a bankruptcy and I lost everything, none of these people's picking up their phone calls. And then once you get back on your feet, it's like, hey, what's up, man? Where you been? We got good job. Blah, blah, blah. So, but you know that's the nature of the game, and you start learning how this game is played and, and nobody's teaching you the real things you need to learn like no. you're making money taxes and absolutely this conversation is wild because i say this all the time we know from um think and grow rich no which what's it called it yeah it is yeah. yeah think and grow rich napoleon hill he references i think he wrote that book in 1928 if i'm right or 1938 one of the two yeah and he says then as he writes that book that the education system is outdated. Really? Now that's all that time ago. And we're still certainly in the UK using the same, pretty much the same education system. It is outdated. We need to know about taxes. We need to understand bankruptcy. We need to know how to run our books. We don't really need algebra unless you're going to be a mathematician or a scientist yeah. and you're going to have to refer to those things. You don't need that. And like you mentioned there that you were bankrupt. No one, no one navigates you through that. You have to kind yeah. of learn as you go. So again, useful to understand from the lived experience later on in your life, but going through bankruptcy is, is, is I'm sure very, very tough. So how did that happen? Didn't pay the land tax one year owning a home. My grandmother was dying and then she died and then, we were, um, she put us in the will. And in America, how it works is that all their bills go to you. So if you die, all your bills go to your daughter. Right, okay. And then she don't know all the bills you got. Because we didn't know my grandmother was paying for people's college tuition and stuff. So yeah. all that. And then the house was deteriorating. And then, yeah, we lost the house, which was a, which was a good thing. It was a great learning lesson. I needed that because it lets me know you don't really own anything. Yeah. If the banks or the state could come. And say this and say that and, and then you miss one payment and they can take it yeah oh, i don't really own it and then yeah. you, in america it's like you got to own the land rights the mineral rights the surface rights the water it's rights. different over there's so in, much yeah. levels of it and they make it look like the american dream is the car the house yes so. but anyway but once again like i said earlier it's all a game so even with the school it's all intentional my when i was in the eighth grade my teacher told me this my, my white teacher told me this he said the schools are meant to make sure you like work at McDonald's or whatever. Yeah. So it's not training you to think for yourself. No, you're right. But he said, he used to tell me, he said, Scott, you got to go out in the world and you'll figure it out. So that's why I learned, like, as I got older, like, okay, this is all a game. 
like since the game of Monopoly. The Matrix, yeah. In the Matrix. And you got to learn how to play it before it play you. Yeah. And once you unplug from it and understand it for what it is and not for what you want it to be, you learn how to move and you learn how money is fake. Yeah. Look, they, they during the pandemic, they were yeah. just giving, giving checks out. Giving digital numbers yeah. dropping in your bank. It's all from made memory. up. Yeah. And once you understand, and that was the matrix. Like you could just, you could be what you wanted to be. Yeah. And that's what America is to an extent, which is a good thing. Yeah. America's built on for lie because if everything is true, then you can't do nothing. You yeah. can't fly. Yeah. But, yeah. But then, but then somebody invented the plane. Yeah. But at one point that was non-existent or like yeah. battery. Anyway. So once you understand just how to flow, you, you're going to win and you're not going to take everything so personal. It took me a long time. Yeah, but that's that's a tough that's a tough thing not to take things personally. When I know that people have have you mentioned there an idea that Reebok basically took and then and then you know obviously must have made money out of or at least tried to, and that was your idea. Mm -hmm. So when people are stealing ideas or copying you, yes, it's a it's a form of flattery. But if it's your idea and someone's taking that, and you're like, hang on a minute, like that's mine. Yeah. You have to get through that anger that that sense of betrayal. And that's happened to you a few times, hasn't it? Where people have taken from you or you've lost things or whatever. And people have, you know, uh, maybe manipulated you or whatever. And I know that that's kind of been a big thing for you where you've had to overcome this level of trust that you probably had for people and learn how yeah. to go through that. So talk to me a little bit about some of those moments as well, because your mindset is different and you, it's because you've had so many of those experiences. Well, so remember what I said earlier, like growing up in, in the hood and all this violence and stuff. And I'm like, Oh, I'm not special. Everybody's going through this. Yeah. That's from, from, from once you get up in business, it's the same thing as nothing changes as far as like, um, Bill Gates snaked Steve Jobs. Yeah. Um, if you watch wrestling, Vince McMahon, he snaked most of Brett the Hitman Hart. Yeah. That's, that's old school. But um, in the music industry, artists get snaked all the time by their mm -hmm. labels, by their partners, by their managers, because they don't understand one word or two yeah. in the contract. So that's just the nature of the business. And then for me, working with um, a lot of people, like somebody like Mikey likes it ice cream, who I helped when he had nothing. He, he was in debt because he didn't pay state tax. Right. So then I came through, we helped him get an investor. Then the investor and him just cut, not just me, me, Ray, Manny, they just cut us out. He couldn't even pay his employees um, payroll. Uh, somebody named Ray was I remember you that. working with him. I remember yeah. you working with him. And I remember you telling me, oh, yeah, he's just basically cut me out. And He, he and, played all of us. Yeah. But guess what? Literally November 2020, 2022. He went out of business. Well, good. So life takes care of everybody. Yeah, it does. And if you're gonna if you're gonna steal from people, be it you know intellectual property, yeah. ideas, if you're gonna copy people, if you're gonna cut people out, that's what's gonna happen in the end. You have to do it. You have to do it from the heart. You have to do it organically. You have to be honest. You have to work really, really, really hard. If you're gonna cut corners and use people, karma's gonna get you. Get some people because you no, know, there's people living a great life that I know have played a lot of people, but, but they had their chips in order and they understood. Um, somebody told me this: you're going to need the three M's to survive. That's money, media, and muscle because, um, you know, of course you need money to whatever, whatever. And then you need media because the pen is mightier than the sword. Yeah. And how people perceive you is how they treat you. Like Trump was good at that. And he, he used to tell reporters back in the day, I don't care what you say about me. Just make sure you put billionaire in front of my yes, name. Yes, I remember you saying that. He wasn't right. a billionaire yet. Yeah. And then you need muscle. So when people come at you, and the muscle can mean like lawyers, all this stuff, you you, you prepared for those fights because you're going to go through some fighting. Well, Ed Sheeran, actually, has been in court Boom. so many times. Boom. Uh, and he's won, actually. Yes. And and you're right with that. Like money, media, muscle is so important. Yeah. Um, and again, sometimes the stuff that you say to me, I'm... I'm really absorbing a lot of it because because you have uh you see most people need a Scott but most people aren't lucky mm. enough to have a Scott mm. okay because I it happened by chance through social media which I'm I always say social media for me has been like it gets a bad rap but it's been yeah. phenomenal because I've met some un unbelievable people yeah. like I say I always say to, to you Scott that you're like family to me because you create your own family in this world and definitely you have been fundamental as as what I would consider family for me, even though you live Thank across you. the pond and we don't see each other. Well, pond. certainly because of COVID, it's a big pond. 
but we don't see each other as much because of COVID, but we were seeing each other a lot. In fact, it was funny because we were going away quite a lot together and seeing each other a lot. And I was saying to Scott, like, you live in New York and I see you more than I see some of my other friends. This is crazy. <laughs> but then COVID hit and we, we didn't see each other for ages. But the reason I talk about you so much and reference you so much, even with clients, I'm always talking about you because you say these kind of little snippets of information and it's just it's just the sort of stuff that you don't get taught in school you certainly don't always get taught in university and if you don't know the right people you're not hearing this information of course everyone's listening to podcasts now yeah. and so these kind of things are being said more but before you know when we met we weren't hearing this information so much but like you'll reference as you did there music wrestling politics books uh, podcasts and 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 as I've said before, you retain so much information and like you are the university. You have got all this. You're the oracle, the guru, and um, so much of what you say is so relevant. Yeah. It doesn't matter who you are. You can really transfer that information and use it somehow. So for you, you know, you learned the hard way because yes. people were taking off you, people were cutting you out, people were betraying you. How do you come back from that every time it happens? Well, speaking of the word university, uh, for you guys that don't know, the, the word university comes from the studies of the universe. And the point is that um, you come back from it by, my grandmother told me this, understanding that a caterpillar doesn't need to read a manual to learn how to be a butterfly. Yeah, that's brilliant. And neither brilliant. do you. So once you understand that, you're born with everything already. The world is telling you, you need school, you need this, you need that. My grandmother would be like, no, you, the world gives you everything for free, it gives you water for free. Well, you have to build your own shelter and your own clothes. But outside of that, nutrition comes from the earth. That's free. Yeah, it's all free. And then you unplug from all these things that that that, that they're telling you you need. Yeah. And um, after she died, like what most people in life, the words you just remember words and yeah. certain conversations. Like, okay, now it's hitting because I get it. It's not gonna hit me in that moment, but it might hit me ten, twenty years from now. But yeah, and not just her lessons. People have taught me so much stuff, and um. I keep that with me as I go forward with everything I do, but, and, and everything you do, you know, you make sure you do everything. It's a better time now. Cause this internet is, has made it equal for everybody. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and now you could get stories. And the reason I talk about all these aspects of life, because like, like our favorite TV show, the wire, it all relates. Yeah. The government relates to the police, police relates to the schools. Yeah. It's, it's all a circle, the streets. Yeah. We all and it's all corrupt. Other. It's yeah. all corrupt. And I know that sounds very conspiracy theorist, but it's not meant to be. It's no. just factual. It is. We yeah. are lied to all the time. We are conditioned a certain way to suit that sociological need, you know, which is to keep us all working for somebody else who's taking yeah. a lot of money <laughs> as yeah. a result of that. You have to. And, and this is where I was saying earlier about getting my trademark registered yeah. because I was learning from you. Yeah. Intellectual property. Own it. You know, once you've got that and you know what to do with it. So my my goal with that, by the way, is to actually then move. We have a creaky door. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I said to you earlier, you know, this, this, this building is so old and things just happen randomly. So if you saw Scott's head twist there, it was just a door opening all by itself. Da -da -da -da. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but going back to the intellectual property, my way of um, using it will actually be to train other people to do what yeah. I do. Um, because the way I work is so different yeah. um, to what a lot of therapists are trained in yeah. their college. As long as they're a registered mental health practitioner or working in the field of coaching, yeah. they can come and train and do what I do, mm -hmm. which is a very creative but very successful process. Hence the reason I've got a three month, four month mm -hmm. waiting list. And you know, and I've been able to buy this property and buy this clinic and do this podcast and invest in these things because I've done this a certain way. Mm -hmm. So what you taught me was own it. And then and then give it to yeah. someone else. Let Learn them buy that from it. you. Yeah. yeah. And so th this is what I mean. This is what I want to share you because there's so much about what you say that is so relevant. And okay, people might hear it in other ways, but you 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 do it in one big box. Here's the box of Scott. Here's the training mm -hmm. manuals, and it all just comes out when you speak. And I love yeah. that about you. Well, here's a quote that um people um pow the powers that be live by: own nothing, control everything. Yeah. So. Control it, meaning you, you trademark and license and patent, wherever you category you want to be in. And then you wholesale it to um, like Coca-Cola wholesales the syrup. They don't make the cans and none of that per country. 
Right. They find other Red Bull does that too. Yes. They don't um because then it takes the maintenance and the responsibility and insurance and employees. Of course. Car, yeah. Trucks. Yeah. They don't gotta deal with none of that yeah. stuff. So um what she's doing is important because that is how some of the biggest companies in the world have, have prospered for like a hundred plus years, you know? And you wanna be into so example, Calvin Klein is like a name and a name and rights agreement, trademarks. And there in America, I can't, I can only speak for America, but it got to be here too. There's over 4,000 categories and of course, more developed like podcasts and stuff. Yes. But Calvin Klein is selling to somebody just in underwear, somebody just in socks, and then like beds, towels, yes. paints, because Ralph Lauren, like, they do paint and they have restaurants, but they're yeah. not dealing with the day-to-day of that. No. They just own the name and then license it out. Virgil, who created Off-White. He didn't own off white or make the clothes. He just owned the word and then licensed it to new See, guards. It's phenomenal. I mean, I know that you know this stuff, and some people mm-hmm. might know this stuff, but just to know that you can own the name yeah. and then you can do so many different things with one name and, and re, a bit like data, you can repackage that name in so many different mm-hmm. ways and sell it in so many different ways yeah. that it is endless, really, isn't yeah, it? Yeah. yeah. Sha- Shaq is in it too. I don't know if you know that. He owns Marilyn Monroe, Frank Sinatra, Bob Marley. So in the States, it got to be here too, but I'm just saying the States, there's before, um, before, life, before life and after, no, you know, your life rights. That's what it's legal. Oh, okay. Called. Owning somebody's life rights and that's why they're alive. And then death rights after they die. That's okay. two separate okay. things. Okay. Got you. So he owns everything after death and he bought it from whoever he bought it from. Well, so Shaq, she, as in Shaquille O'Neal, owns the death rights of the Marilyn name. Monroe. Yeah. Did you say? Marley, Frank Sinatra. Uh, it's more more classic. Now that blows my mind. I did not know that about Shaquille O'Neal. So yeah. Shaquille O'Neal, for those that don't know, I'm sure you all know this. He's obviously a basketballer. Yeah. Um, massive in the '90s and 2000s, I think maybe even yeah. the '80s. I, 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 it must have been the '80s as well when he started his career. And now he owns. And so how how uh, why do people do that? Because obviously anything that's sold under that name, Marilyn, yeah. Mar- he will take the money for. Um, no, her image. He owns oh, her body, the image. Her okay, likeness. got you. Got and, you. And there's levels of owning that too. So, like Vince McMahon owns um, Ric Flair and Stone Cold Steve Austin. I mean, yeah, and The Rock and all of them. He owns the likeness. That's why The Rock. That's why The Rock started using his real name, Dwayne Johnson. Because uh-huh. anything with The Rock on it, he owns. But he can also own mannerisms. You can own mannerisms. People don't even know that Vince McMahon. I learned that from him. That's how he's a billionaire. It's not just so. Explain wrestling. that to me because that that does not that my brain goes. What on earth do you mean? <laughs> um, well, I say the mannerism because the Rock used to do the people's. Elbow. Oh, I see. I see what you right? mean. Or he did the people's eyebrow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. If you do that on TV, he can sue you for that. If wow. he owns it, I mean, if, as long as he don't own it like in the UK, which he yeah, does. yeah, yeah, yeah. But um, I see what you mean. So if someone uses his trademark mannerism, yeah. Then he can the body language. I yeah. Mean. And then he sells it on video games and stuff like that. Wow. That's all per check. He's getting checked for all those little details. And those, and that's what's that as I got more and more in business, I was like, okay, I see how these people are worth what they're worth. It's not just making a song or making a movie. Cause now like it's you can make act the guy who did um Menace to Society, Tay Diggs. No, his name is not Tay Diggs, but the actor who said, What you say about my mama? Yeah, huh? he just did an interview talking about international rights, and he was saying when the movie came out, he only got he well he didn't know the difference. He's like, I got paid for the movie for domestic. Mm. Anything else? That movie went all over the world. That movie made billions. Actually, you know what? Friday is a better example. Ice Cube said um, his biggest regret was not owning Friday properly. That movie only cost twenty four thousand dollars to make. No way. I think the average the actor got five thousand the most, all of them. Wow. And then um. That movie has made like $4 billion That's since like crazy. 1995. Or That's crazy. It, but it's that simple. Because I remember uh, some time ago, actually, we were in Amsterdam. We were talking about a project you were working on at the time, uh, Celebrity. Yeah. And at the time, uh, you were trying to get something so that artists, whatever media they were into, yep. could own uh, the, their products or their their work because yep. you know so many people and even more so now with streaming i don't get this whole industry really but you know how are people making money now because it, it just uh, you know if you if you're streamed say a billion times on yep. a platform i know the platform's making money through advertising and uh, you must be paid like a set fee i guess by the record in so how does it t- tell me how it works because i'm 
I'm blathering here. Okay, yeah. Long story short, um, as of right now, everybody gets paid zero 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 cent of a cent of a cent. Okay, no, no. This is how it works. I'm, I'm gonna speak just for the music industry. Yeah. I don't know if you know that there's a strike right now in America. Right, a strike. Right, a strike. Yeah. Because they're trying to fight it too. Yeah. So let's say I'm Apple Music. Um, we will allocate ten million dollars globally to all artists on our platform. Anything right. we make from subscriptions past ten million is our profit. Got you. So this is why the numbers are never really the same. It's always like a zero zero cent of a cent of a uh -huh. cent. Got because you. Because now at that point, that $10 million is based on how much times you stream, I stream, they stream. And of course, if you stream the most, you're going to get most of that $10 million I see. To be light with it. I see. And, and that's what Spotify and YouTube and all of them do. And Netflix too. They don't got to pay you royalties or nothing like yeah. that. They're just um, all like saying, boom, we making $60 million a month. Let's allocate $5 million strictly to that. And so the rest is our profit. you got to be kind of lucky then say your song's got to blow up on TikTok or whatever mm. for you to then be streamed enough to make some decent money out of it is that what you're saying um if yeah if you care about the TikToks and the instagrams and all that stuff but um if you move right i think like in my opinion somebody vlad tv has one of the best business models in my opinion yeah before the cameras came on i was talking to him about vlad vlad will do a two-hour interview and then he breaks it up into five ten-minute segments that way he's he's and then that stretches him for like good four months yes uh, that's just one he and he normally has about 10 per day he for like the past 12 years yeah he's never stopped no holidays none and he um he spoke about it in a recent interview i could send you the clip where you license the footage and his minimum is 10 grand he said i don't care if it's two seconds one minute so he brought up nipsey hustle when he said when he interviewed Nipsey Hussle in like 2011, it was worth nothing because Nipsey was nobody. You don't he's he like you don't know what the future has in store. Fast forward, Nipsey passes away, he gets murdered. NBC, CNN, yeah, they're all covering it. Networks needed content or B-roll footage. Yeah, so they reached out to him. He yeah, he made like a million dollars just off of all that old footage that wow. you know, was worth nothing. Yeah, so he always talks about building a catalog of just data and content because. You don't know what it's going to be worth yes. down the line. It's an investment. Your time is an investment, especially now. And it could be worth something in, in the long run, couldn't it? Especially if well, you're well, in that culture. Yeah. Everything is worth anything if you find somebody to sell it for yeah. you properly. Yeah. Because yeah. you might not be able to do it. But yeah. Um, like look at Tesla. Yeah. Like, um, Elon yeah. Musk didn't start Tesla. No. He took it. Yeah, because the guys who originally had it wasn't doing good with it. They they created it. That was their baby, and then he bought the stocks, and he basically fired them. Because in America, like I, if I buy all your stocks, I could like rehire a new CEO and get rid. Yes, of Yes, yeah. And that's how he entered the company. Yeah, that's not his company though. Technically, like he didn't start it, and, and a lot of people do that. Yeah. But my point is that Elon Musk is a salesman. Yes. Steve Jobs is a salesman. Yes. Donald Trump is a salesman. Yes. Everybody can't be Donald Trump, and I always tell people you got to find. Like, like in the, at least in the music industry, Suge Knight had um, Jimmy Iovine. Um, Russell Simmons had Leo Cohen and Rick Rubin. Mm. Um, Dr. Dre had Jimmy Iovine with Beast by Dre. Yeah. He's, he's selling it, but Jimmy Iovine is doing the business side. Yeah. So you gotta, you gotta, I don't think people, most people cannot be both. It's very rare. So find that person that's like, I'm going to make this product. And then the publisher or somebody, you're going to help get it in the streets. Yeah. Get it in the stores. Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. everybody can make water. Yeah. But Coca-Cola owns good, good. So who's this? Do you know who, who's who got this? Coca-Cola owns it. Oh, they own this. They bought it in like 2010. And that's how like 50 Cent got yeah. $100 million. Yeah. Oh, by the way, we, we, we're holding up for those that are listening and not watching. So those that are watching yeah. can see we're holding up a bottle of water. Um, and it is a bottle of water that shall remain unnamed in case I get sued. That own... no, you won't get sued. That, that's pretty pressed for now. Okay, yeah, it's smart. It's smart. Yeah. Well, now, now you've said that, yeah. it's on you if I get sued. <laughs> no, you won't get sued. <laughs> it's smart water and it's Coca-Cola that apparently own that. So, you know, uh, these things are just... We, we take it all for granted, don't we? The, the, the bottle of water, there's a whole story and a whole a lot of money behind this. But for you, um, you've got, again, on my mind, I, I could sit and talk to you for hours and we will after this. Sorry. Obviously, you and yeah. I will continue to talk. But 
um, there's still there's still room for more information on this very podcast yeah. um, because Scott, you have then become a media executive, and yeah. uh, you know people that are watching this will see that Scott is shining bright like a diamond <laughs> with all this bling 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 <laughs> bling, which is really uncool of me to say. I don't think anyone says bling anymore yes, apart from the. Oh, good, oh, good. <laughs> I'm not as uncool as I thought I was. I, I just... mean, now they, they also in America they they say drip. Drip. Um, this is my new word now. Water. I'm so, gonna, so I'm, I'm going to say water. you could see Scott. Am I going to say you could see Scott's drip? Is this what we said? Yeah, because yeah, yeah. to me, that has other connotations. A lot of drip. A lot of drip. A lot of drip. Yeah. Scott is very drippy. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think anyone says that. Scott McKenzie is a very drippy man. <laughs> Never, ever, ever copy me, anyone, because you will sound like a fool. No. <laughs> He's mm-hmm. a drippy man, but he's also a, a very uh, diverse man in the sense that you get involved in lots of different businesses. You mentioned Mikey, who betrayed you, who was the ice yeah. cream man, but also you've worked with uh, Pharrell and you've done all these different um, things. But now McDonald's, McDonald's. Mark, yeah. okay. I can remember one of the very first times that I physically met Scott and we were I met him in London. He came over to visit. And it was the very first time I'd actually met him in person. Up until that point, we'd only yeah. ever spoken on the phone. By the shard or something. Like by the shard. Yeah. And we went for a coffee in Starbucks. And you yeah. won't remember this because, well, maybe you will. But it it was a very kind of uh, interesting moment for me because we were sitting in Starbucks and you were just talking about stuff. I remember you plugging your phone in to the charger in Starbucks, yeah. right? <laughs> and the reason I remember that is because at the time, I didn't even know there were charges in places like this. I didn't know they had charging points because that's how, you know, old and fuddy did I am but Scott knows what he's doing he's plugging his thing and this is a few years ago and he says something about marketing and you're like oh yeah because even the way they paint this shop it's done for a certain reason and of course you hear this but I was like yeah you're right like we're not just you know we take it for granted wherever we go whenever we go in somewhere there's a particular reason that it's painted that color or set out in that way and and I think one of the things is is that you just automatically think that stuff. Wherever you go, whatever you do, you automatically think it's that stuff. So even here at Northampton Clinic, best clinic in the world, um, yeah. there is a, a gate at the side. And the reason I painted that gate in graffiti, which is uh, there's a, got a graffiti of a running person, a woman mm. actually, and a big brain on the gate. The reason for that is because this clinic has been here for like, 130 years it's the oldest osteopathic clinic in the country okay. uh, by i think it's 97 years old it's got loads of multidisciplinary health practitioners here mm. we do all sorts of stuff but that's not the interesting bit the interesting bit is that when anyone ever came here they're like oh my god i didn't even know you were here mm. because we're in a um, just to give that context for everyone listening i'm in a very old street in northampton it's all victorian houses and nobody really knew the clinic was here. It's like a, a kind of backstreet clinic in that sense. And so I thought, let me just do this big mural on the gate yeah. so that people see us and remember us when they go past. Yeah. And obviously that's just a tiny, tiny element of me trying to make sure that we're seen. And every business or every brand is doing that. They're trying to be seen, trying to be noticed. And you just think that way all of the time, don't you? That's just how your brain works. You just tune into everything, every detail, all of the time. Well, the powers that be are thinking that way. Yeah, and that's what I said earlier. It's a game, it's a game of monopoly, and and they and they set the board, and um, they 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 plant these DNAs. Um, well, well, Starbucks has this DNA, the green color, or yeah, whatever, whatever. The supermarkets do it too. They they know how to make you. They, everything is intentionally placed. Once you may I ask a question? Yeah. You talk about the green bit there. Sorry yeah, to yeah. put in, but they you their symbol is like a mermaid, isn't it? Starbucks. Yeah. Yeah. Why the mermaid? Do you know? Because that doesn't really resonate with coffee no, for me. I, you know what? Howard Schwartz, who start, who he did the same thing Elon Musk did. Uh, yeah, I, I don't know why. Because he he's not the original founder. Oh, of okay, he okay. bought it from the guys who they was fell and had the business. Yeah. Doesn't so it's just there's a. I've always wondered why is the mermaid the symbol? I forgot why. I did. I did find out but i don't remember why but that, that's kind of those random little things that now i would never have thought before well they're from seattle ah okay seattle is um on the it's on the west coast and it's it's water based but, oh so that makes more sense then yeah something it's probably like something to do with that but you want to yeah but you want to everybody got their own dna right yeah. somebody comes to you because you make them laugh whatever whatever yeah you know you might be sexy something like that well me yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, you know like, like, like an instagram <laughs> model or something you know i'm definitely but, not sexy <laughs> but when people follow you talk to you whatever they they, they so you got to understand your dna 
And in yeah. business, I mean, life is business to me, but it's, it's all the same thing. But yeah, once I started expanding my horizons and, and just how this world works, I realized like, yeah, everything has its DNA. So like example, um, did, it, it's all we're gonna relate what I'm about to say. When George Zimmerman shot um, Trayvon, the reason was he was wearing a, a, a hoodie, right? Yeah, because he said, oh, I thought he was carrying a gun. Yeah. But, but, but he, he had wasn't. A hoodie on his head. Yeah, it was just a mobile phone, wasn't it? He uh, had a no, mobile Skittles. phone. Oh, Skittles. Yeah, Sorry, Skittles. my bad. So he's got Skittles in his pocket, and this guy goes, Oh, I, I thought he was carrying yeah. a gun. Yeah. And he approached him. Yeah. So during that time with those arguments, I used to tell people, I'm just going to talk about DNA. I said, what is, the, what is the DNA of the hoodie? When have you ever seen the hoodie on a black man in a positive setting? Yeah. Now, you don't, I don't agree with him killing Trayvon, but you got to understand that when people see these things, they, they're going to, um, put it in a box no you're right you're so stuff. right uh, that's uh, that, just to give you a very brief story my yeah. brother obviously i'm white he's white yeah. um he was visiting before before i didn't speak to my mum and dad but he was visiting my mum and dad and yeah. and above my mum and dad lived a, a little old lady called doreen and her son who was an yeah. older man was visiting doreen and my brother was standing outside and he smoked he was having a cigarette mm. it was probably a naughty cigarette just to mm. give a bit more information but anyway he was and he had a hood up and this man uh, you know just thought he was some sort of intruder because he had a hood up mm. and me and my brother actually on my birthday we fell out over this because i was going well you know tom if if someone sees you with a hood up they're going to assume and, you know, I would feel uncomfortable walking along a dark street with someone with a hood up because you do that, de like you say, that yeah. DNA, that kind yeah. of deep set conditional belief is yeah. someone with a hood up is dangerous. Yeah. yeah. Yes. And and movies have put that in our brain. And our yeah. brain can only store so yeah. much information. So then we'll just comp comp compartmentalize. That's something. right. Yeah. So example, though, but look at Europe, like England. And as far as the image that I know you guys aren't aware of, but like England puts out to the world um rolex um Rolls royce uh, burberry jaguar um, 007 james bond yeah. jaguar yeah all these images make england appear a certain way and i also think when i first came here, i was like you know i get the concept of the royal family they're a market employee yeah for this country yeah and not for you but but for like white people the powers that be i feel like yeah. that this is in their brain they're like we yeah need the, because there's royal families that still exist now yeah thailand and that's other right countries. yeah yeah. they don't yeah. show them no but I, I could be home in new york and and the the, the prince charles and them or whatever they're yeah. all on the damn tv yeah yeah, why, yeah. Why, why should i care about them yeah but i get it i get it and and what it is so anyway once you understand that now when this country does something it's worth more you know? yes you, you can charge five times the price yeah where china can or haiti can or yeah Jamaica can, yeah 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 but but then, but example, how many of us will go to Pakistan? Yeah. There well, are good parts of Pakistan. There's good of parts course of Syria. Yeah, 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 you're right. There's good parts of Ukraine, but yeah. that's not what they're going to show you. No, no, they're not. So you got to be, so once you understand the branding of things, you 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 move accordingly. And for, at least for me, I try to have a consciousness of it because I'm aware that if somebody's never met a black person and they saw 50 Cent, yeah. they go, oh, man, they all just uh where do rags yeah and yeah yeah shoot each other well, well, there is this there is this unconscious bias which i i actually hate the word unconscious bias uh the words because i actually think when it comes to race there's not really an excuse anymore we have enough exposure to all sorts of people of all sorts of cultures but there is still this dna if you like in people where racism still exists and it always will and there's very little you can do about the mindset of certain people because it's in their families and it's in their daily conversations and so on and so forth but you're right it's the same with the royal family yeah. you know we are conditioned to see things a certain way i quite like the fact that we we have the royal family only because it is something different it doesn't mean i agree with the way the royal family have conducted themselves over the year years because because I, I, I genuinely don't but the story because yeah. everything is stories yes and we we really respond to stories yeah. and i think that's that's what makes every culture different is the story of that culture. And we, we buy into stories. We just got to be careful that we're also telling the truth and that if we're going to have the story of the Royal family and everything else, we need to know the truth. Like, I think I can't remember which diamond it is, but basically there's a diamond in that, you know, we've just had the King's coronation. Mm -hmm. He wore that very big crown. I don't know if you saw any of the pictures yeah. of it, but one of the big diamonds, I think it's a diamond has, was stolen from Africa and it yeah. actually belongs to Africa, you know, and, yeah, it's a beautiful crown and yes, it's the king's coronation and yes, it's all fancy and all that stuff. But we need to know the stories behind the stories. Yeah. So I'll say this. 
I know I'm going to r- ruffle some feathers with, with racism, but it's just so people understand. When Trump said they're bringing in drugs, they're rapists, he was talking about Mexicans, remember? Yeah, that? yeah, I do. He said that. Yeah. I'm with, my girlfriend's Mexican. I know. Our whole family's in the house losing their mind. I go on YouTube. Yeah. I said, let me show you something. <laughs> I'm not agreeing with what he's saying. Yeah. But if I'm a white person who don't know much Mexican, and I'm a wealthy white person, I don't yeah. really deal with no other yeah. culture but my own. Yeah. Let me tell you why he would think that. I showed them wrestling. People forget back in the 90s, there was a Mexican tag team. I forgot the name. They used to come down the, down, down the ring in a lawnmower. Um, I showed them a uh, family guy, South Park. I just, I showed them movies. Yeah. I said, this is the perception of yeah, your culture. Yeah, you yeah. can change it. Yes. But you can't be mad at just Trump because he's not, that doesn't just come out of nowhere. He's yeah. seeing stuff. Yeah. And then, you know, things like narcos and, and shows like that, that just show only the drug yeah, side of it. Yeah, you're right. You are and there right. is a richer culture. So now, and so I, so I told them example, when El Chapo got caught, all the news channels said, Mexican drug lord El Chapo. Yes. When Bernie Madoff got in trouble, they don't say Caucasian white man, Bernie Madoff. <laughs> That's intentional. Because yeah. I need you, the people, to think y'all all like that. Yeah. Y'all, y'all are all not like it's that. It's all control. And it's not somebody in uh, Switzerland's fault who generally don't know. Uh, um, Just like um, when a young black boy had the monkey king of the jungle shirt on oh, h&m oh yes 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 god that was a few years ago now that wasn't was a it? big conversation that in was a big I'm conversation like, oh, God, how could they not know i'm like listen because i've traveled now i understand the black experience is not the same everywhere no it's not and i i don't know the black experiences with people in sweden from yeah history. but example yeah. like in england i know y'all didn't go through lynchings and stuff yeah so you're not going to relate the same way so so to, i'm like the, the monkey don't mean the same there that it means here the same way y'all call cigarettes faggots yeah, yeah, but yeah. That facts, word yeah. in America yeah. is a negative term. Yeah, and and the fanny pack. We, yeah, yeah. <laughs> the fanny pack. Uh, it's funny. <laughs> yeah, you have the fanny pack, but obviously we call the vagina the fanny. See? So when we hear mm-hmm. someone say the fanny pack, we're like, oh, <laughs> See? I fanny. Didn't even know that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so yeah, you're right. We call cigarettes fags, actually. Yeah. And I know you call gay people. Yeah, it's a, a detrimental terminology and so on. But the monkey thing, actually, yeah. I have to say, here in British football. Um, th- that is th- the same here. So in in British football, uh, you will hear monkey chants on a pitch repeatedly when there's a black football player. It's a massive, 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 massive issue. Um, racism in football is people would like to think that it's not a big deal. It is. It's a massive, massive problem in this country. Um, racism mm. is awful on for, in football, and the FA, which are the Football Association. Yeah aren't doing enough to combat it. And and those monkey chants, they're absolutely horrifically used in this country and, and in the UK for footballers. And and actually kids at school, you know, you, you see this um quite often. So but you're right, in other parts of Europe, I don't I don't know, and we're not even in Europe now. But, you know, yeah. in, in parts of Europe, I, d- I don't know the black experience. I don't know what it's like to be a Chinese person in, say, Italy. I don't know what it's like. Everyone's going to have such a different experience. But you're right. The control aspect of this is how we want you to see black people. This is how we want you to see yeah. white people. This is how we want you to think of England. This yeah. is how we want you to think of America. Until yeah. you travel, and you have traveled. I know you've traveled greatly, actually. Until you've traveled, you don't no yeah so that's where you have to have the lived experience and that's what i was saying earlier about let's hear each other yeah let's really yeah, hear yeah, each other yeah. and let's understand what we know about each other and what we don't know about each other because that's the only way to really live and learn talking about the diverse uh knowledge that you have it's yeah. also diverse in business i mentioned celebrity which oh, yes. actually sort of came and went didn't it because of a, a time i think there was a uh I don't know if it was a team issue, a financial issue. It, was, it just never grew into yeah. what you wanted it to be. But what's great about you, Scott, is that you always have so many, again, being diverse. And I think this is, I want to highlight this for a reason. Mm. Diversity in business. So I'm a therapist. I own yeah. a clinic. I'm also doing a podcast. Right. I've written a book. I've got right. my social media. So diversity in business. You can be lots of different things under one name, as we said earlier. And Scott, what I know about you is that you will dabble in lots of different areas. So sex industry is something yeah. you're very keenly interested in yeah. and have been involved in for lots of lots of well, the whole yeah. time I've known you. I seem to remember you having um a dildo made actually. I was just thinking that, yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. It's on Amazon. I don't know what to type in and get it though. Yeah, so you have a dildo on Amazon. Molded out of me, yeah. Molded out of your manhood. Yeah. 
the the I was going to say the little Scott, but I know for a fact you're not a little Scott. No, no. no. And then I, I say I know for a fact as though I've seen it. Just to well, confirm, on, I haven't it's, it's seen the internet. it. I put it on the internet. I've seen I've and, seen an image, yeah. but I haven't seen it. I just want to make yeah, that yeah, clear yeah. to everybody that's listening. <laughs> we haven't gone there, yeah. but um, I know that uh, uh, you've also been involved in, like I say, the celebrity thing, which was about artists and creating a space for them to own their stuff. What has well, happened with that? What happened with it? So long. So to make it short, um, 2014 to 2019, I had a tech, a tech company called Celebrity. I was doing podcasting back in 2012, and I was telling people, "This is the free, this is the future. This is the wave." And it was just so hard to get people to, to invest in, in it. Um, at that time, and then it blew yeah. up. At the time, I was I made a website and an app, and it was much more expensive than to do these things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then, um, um, yeah, I, I, it, all in all, everything we predicted came true. Yeah. And you were the, just too early for it. Is um, that fair to say? A, a little too early. It's just, you know, you know what? There was no business structure in podcasting at that time. Right. Properly the way it is now. Yeah. Like Joe Rogan got $100 million. You yes. Know? Um, but one thing I see, which is still a problem, but it is what it is, is that Spotify and all of them are like, oh, we could get all these podcasters and now we don't have to pay them publishing. We don't have to, we don't have to pay them royalties because they're not like music artists. Yes. They'll make content for free and yeah. give it to us for free. Yeah. And they're still eating off all the subscribers. And yeah. all I was trying to tell people was that we should treat, not just podcasting, I'm just saying that category. We should treat this all like the radio. The radio has to pay a mechanical royalty of nine cent per minute. Your song is on the air. And guess what? The streaming services could do that too. They don't want to because they yeah. know everybody don't know that. Yeah. And I'm like, if podcasting and everybody did that, the game, the game would change. But it's it's just before like Netflix had did that documentary about the um um technology. It was called Social. I forgot what it's called. Oh yes, I know. Yeah, they... I was talking about all that way before that came out, and uh, it was just hard to get people to, to listen because I get it. Was it was too I'm early. Not... It was too early, I think. But I also think because I'm young and I'm black, and I I don't mean I like to bring up race, but I when I went to Silicon Valley, I realized you know. It's, but why don't you want to bring it race? Because I think that is part of your lived experience. So you should bring it up. It should be like, if that's your experience, that's your experience, Scott, and we need to hear it. No, I mean, it is because I just look at it like it is what it is. Like, so I don't know if you remember when that, there was a white lady that told LeBron James to shut up and dribble. I mean, yeah. I know what that line meant. And I feel like well, yeah, when I will go places in Silicon Valley and all that, it's just everybody be looking at you like you don't have the type of intelligence to even be thinking that, that deeply about stuff. So, you know, you live in that box. I, I've been to the banks. I, I I asked the banks, like, you should partner with me and, and let's pay. It was just crazy. I was I was just more proud of myself. I was getting those types of meetings. I sat yeah. down with MasterCard, Visa. Yeah. Um, I sat down with, like, all types of big, powerful people in the world. But everybody was just – and they're older, too. So I get, like, what the hell's a podcast? I don't know that. That's, but, but you know, I'm going to tell you this. And I remember thinking this at the time when you were telling me that you were – meeting with these people and and you were having this kind of experience of I'm proud of myself because I've got in front of these people and and I was like yeah that's so cool and then you know to know that people reject it just because you're a black man you might say it is what it is but I'm referring to James Elliott's podcast with me just a minute well I say a minute ago it went out this week he says he hates that term mm. and I agree because I don't like this yeah I don't it is like what I make this it to be. yeah it is what I make it to be but I'm telling you now I'm angry on behalf mm. of you that people reject your ideas which were doing basically paying people for their product be it a podcast or whatever and to allow people to have that space to earn some money off of their good work or whatever and to be rejected because essentially and 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 it is this in your experience because you're a black man and they think you haven't got the intelligence to do this that is fucked up and it isn't it, it, it isn't to me anyway it is what it is it's a case of we need to change that narrative and we need to change it very very quickly because it's not okay because you are super intelligent and i don't like the fact that someone did that to you now maybe me saying that is completely out of turn because I haven't had your experience and I don't know what it's like to have that experience. But I'm just saying that's how I feel. And I, I am not somebody that has experienced that because I am five foot two, I am white and I am now blonde because I went very gray and dyed my hair. So, you know, I don't have that experience. I do know what it's like to be rejected as a female for not being skinny and beautiful mm. and all of those things because, you know, I'm a size 10 to 12 in yeah. the UK, it's quite curvy. So, But I don't know what it's like to live with that generational trauma that you've had you know, the experience of that you carry in your history and your DNA. And it pisses me off. 
Well, I'll say this, going back to the stereotype of the hoodie. Yeah. In the tech world, the stereotype is like, you got to look like Mark Zuckerberg. Yeah, like you, a geek. I, I can look like a rapper to some people. I don't just yeah. like this all the time, but I'm making a point. So their, their whole thing is like, where's your t-shirt? Where's your, yeah. know, whatever he wears. And then, um, so yeah, I do think everything is in, is in the packaging. And I was like, maybe I didn't package myself properly. Yeah, but then you shouldn't go changing for anyone either. This is who you no, are. No, no, definitely not. But look at The Banker. I don't know if you've seen the movie The Banker. It came out on Apple. I Plus. haven't seen it, no. Um, Samuel L. Jackson. Um, long story short, everybody should watch this. based on a true story of two black men who, who created their own bank in the 1940s during slavery. And they used the white man to be the front up the bank like make him he 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 supported black people so they made him look like he owned it uh-huh. and they were buying all the real estate they wound up going to jail yeah they died in jail right like that. but it was a good film because when i watched it, i was like that is the reality of it like they know i i cannot do that as a black person i need this person to be the look and even as a female you might need the man to come in because maybe if it's a because oprah talks about that if it's yeah. all these men in the room yeah yeah yeah. Not you yeah. yeah unless yeah. you're famous like yeah oprah. yeah but even she says like I'd be like, it's not even about being a black person. She's like, I'm the only woman. Yeah, and yeah. I got to talk to all these yeah. executives about yeah. my ideas. Blah, blah, blah. Well, yeah, you learn. Like I said, it's all packaging. And, and once you understand that, like I said, it's all a game. And now I understand how to play it. You know, I, now I have a better relationship with the banks. Yeah. And, and I realized I didn't need to go to Silicon Valley to venture capital. I could have just built a relationship with my local banker. Yes. The way. The Chinese people do it when yeah. they come to America. They and the Indians when they want to build laundromats in the hood. Yeah, they go to the small banks, borrow money from them, yeah. start a Chinese store. Yeah. So now I'm I'm in that space, but but so this company was my biggest win, even though it was my biggest failure, because it made me understand how to be even more self reliant. It yes. was the, the, the biggest lesson college couldn't even teach me this, and it forced me to realize how much I could get done because every time I needed the money, because my fr- the first. Four people I hired to do the app. They stole the money. They wanted a 10 grand deposit. And then I never heard from them again. So then I'm like, okay. So the app world is snaky, sneaky, yeah, and yeah, fake yeah. developers. Yeah. Of, you know, it's people selling you. They just tell you what you want to hear and then they take your money. Yeah, because honesty and integrity and authenticity are the three things that I live by. Yeah. And you do get, you do meet people and you think, oh, this person's the real deal. And it turns out they're just full of smoke and mirrors. But I know you've had that experience. However, right now, going back to that kind of the way you diversify, yeah. sex industry, jewelry industry, uh, tell me about the other stuff that you're doing as well. So as of right now, so Webby led me into the venture we have right now. We have a company called River Phoenix Acquisition Agency. And we basically are in like the mergers acquisition category of stuff. So like... um. If you heard Hurt Hertz Corporation, they bought Complex. They partnered with Verizon in the States to buy Complex Media, which is a hip hop media. And then um um Vivendi, which is based in France, owns Universal Music Group. And then Universal Music Group owns Drake and all these artists. So I look at myself as like, I want to be Black Stone Group, Black Rock Group. I want to be a shadow bank. But we don't necessarily gotta get funding or even pay people funding. Just like Sean Parker. With Facebook, I could connect people to it because that's what I've done most of my life. Yeah, you are a connector, definitely. And when I saw the Social Network movie, I realized, wow, I'm Sean Parker. And for those that don't know Sean Parker, he created Napster. Napster failed. He got with Mark Zuckerberg. He said, I could get you billions of dollars. It's in the movie. Justin Timberlake played him. And he said, out of that deal, I want 10%. That 10% wound up, he wound up getting $2.6 billion. Yeah. He took that money and started Spotify. Yes. And that was his redemption from Napster. Yes. So when I look at Sean, and he's done more, but that's just a big, the bigger story. So when I just look at Sean Parker, I was like, oh, I'm Sean Parker. I yeah. did that for free yeah. all the time. Yeah. I never asked for nothing in yeah. return, but no, no, that's foolish. So anyway, because, you know, we, we all are, are one idea away from being multi-billionaires, you know? Yeah. It ain't hard these days. No. You know? but once again, it's all in the IP, yes. how you own it. Ray Kroc took McDonald's from the McDonald brothers. Yes. Most people that get rich, it's not off of their ideas. It's because they saw it. They took it from somebody else. Yes. I mean, and even like, sorry, go back to like Mexican culture, Taco Bell, Chipotle. Um, those are white people that own it. Yeah. They just go to, and, 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 and that's what makes England win too, as a country for like yeah. 400 years. And we well, speak for stealing English. things, you mean? 
I mean, well, to me, it's like, um, look, I, I had a Jewish boss and he said in marketing, they call it R&D, research and development. Yeah. He said the Jews call it replicate and duplicate. <laughs> we don't do nothing new under the sun. We let y'all do that. And yeah. I had to respect it. Yeah. This man named Solomon, he, own, he owns a company called Vita Group. He taught me the biggest lessons in life. He said the difference between the rich and the poor is the rich know the value in their name and the poor know the value in their work. IP, the name. Yeah. And, um. He also told me, and most people might look at it as racism, but I'm like, no, he's being honest. He said, listen, we're the brains, you're the feet. Our yeah. job is to think it, and your job is to do the damn work. But he paid me the most I've ever been paid in my life. Wow. And, he, and, he, and he paid all these other black people the most I've ever been paid. Because he'll yeah. just write you a flat check and go, ooh, you, you got this trademark IP for this uh, psych, psych, psychiatric stuff? I'll buy it right now. Right. Because he's going to know how to sell it. Yeah. Everybody's not going to know how to sell it. So anyway, he made me see that part of it. And, and and that's what River Phoenix does is we just whatever you need help with, especially if you have traction. But if you don't, depending on the product, I could work it out, too. We can take you to the next level because Mikey likes it was a friend of mine who was making ice cream out of his home. And then we helped him be a brand separate from the ice cream, the way Virgil is a brand separate from Off-White. Yes. And he can do something with Nike and Louie. And, yeah. And Off-White is like his own thing. Yeah. And he was the only ice cream man with a sneaker deal. Um. He was on CBS Sports as like a regular, I guess, anchor journalist. And then this is this is just an ice cream man. So I was like, yeah. I'm always just like, don't look at it one way. You know, if, if we are growing lemons, we can make um, lemon water. We can make lemon uh, fabric softener. Yeah. We can, we could, because because um, there's a company called Jivadon and they own flavors. Wow. And they sell flavors. They wow. have patents to flavors. You can do it too, though, you know. They own the seeds to like tomatoes and stuff uh, uh, with Monsanto's and um, DuPont. And there's another big brand that does that. But and they like GMO it. But the point is like um, like um, in the States, I don't know how it is out here. Um, Nestle and Coca-Cola own wells. Yeah. Oh, they call it water banks. Yes. You can the water banks in America go for two hundred dollars a year. Mm. people don't know that like so if you got a good water bank around your neighborhood they'll just buy it and then they make the water from that and then they'll say it's from poland or they'll say it's from <laughs> italy yeah. like san pellegrino like, san pellegrino is not from italy it's from michigan but you know the, you know that person don't know but it go back to the story yeah it goes back to the story diamonds are are not worth anything i'm oh so we partner with a jeweler and i shouldn't even be saying this but i'm being real it's just the story you're buying into yeah it ain't really worth anything no. They they send it here and they mark. I've been to Africa. I've seen how much jewelry costs out there. It's pennies on the yeah. dollar. And also, I, I'm I'm not down with the diamonds. I will never re yeah. I will never wear a real diamond because yeah, I know that kids are losing arms and legs over it, and that's just not where I'm at. And and nobody want to talk about that. No one want to talk about that. But, but I because, I can't help talk about that because I will never wear a diamond. You will never catch me wearing a diamond. But you see, even to go back earlier, what I said with like all the conflict and stuff, I went through trauma and stuff. Yeah, there's conflict chocolate. Yes, I know you, and that's where you, and you can think you're buying something that's fair, yeah. only to find out, like fair trade or whatever, or ethical sourcing, only to find out, oh, actually, we were lied to because the story, the story, the story, yeah. the story. We buy into stories we did from day one. Disney, you know, we buy yeah. into the Disney princess. How many women are looking for their prince because they yeah. believe that Disney is how? Because we were all fed the Disney stories. Yeah. There is no prince. You've got to be your own prince and the princess all in one person. And then you attract the person that aligns with you. Don't look for a prince because yeah. he's going to be flawed too. If you look perfection in anything, whether it's a person, whether it's a product, you're going to be disappointed. You've got to keep it real. Listen to the story, but then break it down and see what's actually real. That's why I don't think, at least me, I don't participate in like social justice warrior stuff I see online with this yeah. cancel culture stuff. Because guess what? You drive a car. That gas comes from Nigeria yeah. as one place. And yeah. guess what? Those people um, are getting killed and got to do, you know, their, their crops. It's, yeah. it's on YouTube. Their crops yeah. get destroyed yeah. because of those shell, BP. Yeah. yeah. You can't even drive a car because the the the, um, the minerals come from um, Congo, Africa. Well, you know, someone, I can't remember what I saw it on now, but it was, someone was talking about slavery and they were saying, you know, oh no, I don't, I wouldn't buy anything. You know, a bit like me talk about the diamonds there. I wouldn't buy that because of, you know, and then someone went, do you eat food? Do you drink water? Do you wear clothes? Because if you do, the chances are you're a part of it. Yeah. And I was like, oh, oh yeah. yeah. You know, however ethical, you could try to be ethical. You could try to be fair. You can try to be informed, but you'll probably never know the real truth because as we were saying before, we are being lied to all the time um 
So tell me about some of the stuff you're doing sure. now. So we're doing jewelry. We're doing we're doing um, potentially in the, the porn the industry entertainment world. Yeah. yeah. So I, I have this company called Please Don't Tell. And I'm still molding it, but I have a good vision for it. And um, but we're making novelty products. We got some um, KY jelly for your bum. <laughs> <laughs> for your bum. Yeah. For your butt. Uh, that's that's only. that's a really disgusting picture. Feeling yeah. a little bit sick with that. But the, Yuck. The, the donut. Is it a donut? Yeah, it's a donut. It looks a like an plate anus. And an, yeah, uh, yeah. I, I don't, don't want to touch that box. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know where that box has been. <laughs> yeah. So you just see what well, you're smiling. And I wanted to make novelty <laughs> products that smile. Can I show them my boxes? It has a curse word on you it. You can show okay. anyone your boxes. Oh, Suck my yeah. dick. <laughs> <laughs> Love. Please don't tell dot com and don't is with an X. D X N T. Tea. It's all out of fun. It's just a yeah, novelty yeah. item. But we're going to make like adult entertainment. But I also want to do, I want to do something like you're doing, but I don't want to do a podcast, but like real conversation about things in the shadows. Like somebody, let, let's say I make an episode like, please don't tell I'm gay. Please yeah. don't tell them, um, um, whatever. And then I think that's really important though, because I think yeah. the, the, the sex industry as a whole it's always going to be there it's one of the oldest you know yeah. industries in the world we all you know have done it or do do it we wouldn't be here without we it. wouldn't be here without it so i think and one of the one of the things i always say is we don't talk about bowels we don't talk about sex we don't yeah, talk about right, death we so. need to you know we need to talk about all of those things and i think um there's no shame in sex the problem is with with sex is so many people are like doing weird and amazing things with their sex lives no one wants to talk about it because everybody's holding some level of shame so i i always respect the fact that you're out there making it fun um putting donuts on packages that are like anus yeah. <laughs> wearing uh wearing your shorts that say shut my dick you know this is all funny stuff ha 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 but also it's important to talk about on a broader level so if you do do conversations about that work with the prostitutes and the ex escorts and the people you know maybe the the uh the, the guys and girls that are in the industry that are, are really informative about the truth behind how people are treated in that industry. I think that would be amazing. Yeah. Yeah. I want actually, you mean the adult entertainment? Industry? Yeah. 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 Well, I mean now look, I'm meeting people from OnlyFans and they're like multimillionaires. Yeah, I I've know. Few, and, um, and I'm glad there's OnlyFans because yeah. actually if you have the desire to make your money that way, then do it. It's on your own time. It's on your own time. You, you know, it, there's no shame. Like I said, there's no shame in it. Yeah. Well, people are, I mean, if you could get paid to bust a nut, I don't get why <laughs> you want it. <laughs> and it's a new time because uh, at least from a hip hop point of view, Cardi B has an OnlyFans. She's not having sex on it, but uh, Tiger's is having sex on his OnlyFans. Safari's having sex on his OnlyFans. It's like nobody's actually, I met an actor. I never heard of him. He he's, he's a, he's a, he's a gay performer. And he's on um, CSI or a big like television show, right? And I was like, "Damn, really?" And they're like, "Yeah, he he's doing both." He, yeah, you know, it's a new world. Nobody judging you no more of that. Maybe yeah, back in like um, Pamela Anderson. Yeah, Lee days, she, she she got slated, yeah. crazy, but, and that was stolen from her. Yeah, you know, I, I, that documentary Pamela Anderson. I have to say, like, I love Pamela Anderson. Me too. I think Pamela Anderson is one of the most awesome women in the world. She has had some trauma in her life. She was a, just a beautiful young girl that made the most out of being a beautiful yes. young girl. And when that tape got stolen and she got slated, as you say, now people are like, yeah, I'm a, I reference a girl that I work with. She was a client of mine. And when COVID happened, yeah. she, um, she was a very young single mum. She went on to OnlyFans because she was beautiful. She made some money. And without OnlyFans, who knows what she would have gone through? You know, she needed to feed her son. And why not? More power to her. You know, it's a safer way than doing it than being on the street. So I, I, I think OnlyFans is really important. And I'm, I'm kind of glad that the world's moved in that direction. No, that thing changed the world. Yeah. And and so we're doing that. And, and also music industry. You were working with... Uh, a Boogie. A Boogie, and, yeah. Um, I just was part of with Brother Hassan Sharif doing tour management with Jada Kiss, A Boogie. Now Shanti, what he is. Um, all in all, but I've worked with other artists too. But all in all, we did Versus and we made some history with Dipset versus The Locks. We did production on that. So just responsible for like, from hiring security to car service to where the where the camera's gonna be. Yeah. Um sound engineering, um, which I don't know, but we we hired those yeah, people. Yeah, yeah. Like so what you were saying earlier, you bring people in. I just bring people together to yeah. get the job done because everybody don't know how to outsource that, especially globally, like when you're traveling and it, I don't know, it could be anything, you know, bulletproof vests 
um, yes, because in hip hop, you know, you, you need you need like bulletproof cars and stuff. People don't really know where to get all that stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So You're the man you that can. It. You're the man yeah. that can, and that's kind of that's your unique selling point, I guess, is that you, from what I've known of you, for as long as I've known you, you've just brought shit together. That's yeah. what you do. I don't know how to even put it in, in words when people ask me what I do, because we just nothing we don't do. Yeah. And and now, like, lately being in the food industry, yeah. which is my favorite industry, because who don't like to eat? But but the, the joy I see when people eat and the networking that's done on with a plate of food, I'm like, I want to, I, I was with a, a chef yesterday, and we were talking, and she's from New York. So when we oh, get wow. back home, we're going to reconnect. How cool. But she, yeah, the food industry is, is a beautiful industry. I love restaurants and stuff. And I want to be more on that. Yeah. And I, I want to work on making product, high end, good products, yeah. you know, because you eat clean. And I want to focus on people eating clean because I am, I am eating more clean. And, yeah. But how do we mass produce it? And, um, yeah, just, 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 and, and get more people away from, the junkie stuff. Yeah. yeah junkie i don't food. want to like judge people and say meat and stuff but yeah 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 whatever's bad yeah 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 whatever we perceive you know sometimes talking about me although i don't eat meat as you yeah. know um and that's more of an ethical choice for me again but it's a we will go down that rabbit hole another day um you know i also know that there's a lot of very important nutrition from me as long as it's good sourced meat and i know that a lot of people need meat so i'm not like oh you're a bad person if you eat meat but just generally eating clean yeah. whether you're vegetarian vegan pescatarian whatever you want to call yourself just eating clean and nutritionally is important isn't it yeah it, it takes a toll on your body look i feel like this is the first time in our lives we're seeing people die so young yeah I mean, i'm seeing people get cancer i like from my high school i know people that got cancer by the time they were 30 and yeah, one in two people will get cancer. That's the that's the reality. That's the statistic. But I feel like when I was growing up, it wasn't this frequent. Well, we're looking at things like pollution, stress. Yeah. Stress is a massive, massive, massive cause of all disease because cortisol is corrosive. Cortisol is your stress hormone. It's corrosive. It creates acid. Acid creates inflammation. Where there's inflammation, your body's got to work harder to stay alive. So it takes years off your life match that with poor nutrition, match that with um, pollution, match that with, yeah. you know, not moving your body, then you've got a bit of a time bomb. And Don't and that's why we see, yeah, technology. Yeah. So we've got one in two people with cancer. So we have to learn how to live our best selves, our best lives, but you know, health, mind, body, soul, all of that stuff, which is what this show is all about. And that's why I think laughing you know, helps. And um, yeah, La laughing, <laughs> laughing, sex, food, you know, if yeah. you can do all three at the same time, yeah. then you're winning. <laughs> yeah, 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 which you can do. Yeah, yeah. you can do. You can and I'm sure you have done. Yeah, you can pour some <laughs> chocolate on somebody's booty and lick it. <laughs> and then laugh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> As you're doing it. Not recommending that, but if you do do it, let us know. <laughs> oh, in America, they're doing everything. You know, the women eating guys' booties now. It's yeah. Great. They call it toss a salad. Or, yeah. Um, actually, it's a new slang in the black community called... um taking him to the gucci store oh i just i just learned this like oh, that's how old i'm getting i'm like taking what the hell's him, a gucci store and that's them going do something to his anus well they call it the gucci licking between the balls and oh the balls. i see so, so the girls i say, see i want to take you to the gucci store oh wow i've been seeing this on instagram i hope these girls <laughs> are making sure these guys are showering before they go but i want to make sure that's happening well, that's because the, these girls need to have that in a contract wash <laughs> your butt I would assume so. I mean, before when we get off the camera, I'll show you um, Suzuki. This girl is like, she's my favorite right now because she she's just an entertaining character and going to. Oh, story. I see. I see. In America, you know, everybody's a is a damn entertainer or a personality. Yeah. You know, I'm just saying Trump because he he's a personality. Uh, but on that note, by the way, yeah, I know we're talking about buttholes, but yeah. and that's why I'm thinking about Donald Trump. Um, what do you think about his new campaign uh, to be president again? What What do you think is going to happen there? I don't. Look, this is my opinion. I don't got. I don't care neither about Democrat or Republican, but um, I think he's gonna win. Uh oh. I, I don't think Biden um has strong legs to stand on. I'm just going by what the public is feeling. Yeah. Thing, especially because the country is not doing good right now. And was it doing better with Trump? Actually, I mean, yeah, everybody e was get, everybody was get, getting money or giving money, and um, outside of this, his, his antics and stuff. I mean, I mean, look. It, it, People feel Barack Obama ain't doing enough. People feel Bush ain't doing enough. People gonna feel like you don't do enough. Yeah, you, you, you have people that work here. You know, you well, they actually, they actually they you know actually think I'm phenomenal. So, <laughs> yeah, no, but you had you I'm not had starting anywhere with some people. <laughs> oh, oh, previously, yeah. oh yes, yeah. not now. Yeah, so yeah, sure, the, yeah. As the leader, 
it's, it's everybody's not gonna gonna yeah. mess with you. It, yeah, it's life, you know. I, I do do your best. I try my best not to judge because I don't know what it's like to be president, and I don't. And I try my best not to judge any job title unless I'm gonna be it. So that way, just like we said earlier with people's stories, like yeah, I, I'm not in position to judge because I've never been a cop or I never. Yeah. So so Scott. Yeah. Um, Sorry. No, don't you never need to apologize for me. This has been the most phenomenal couple of hours of my life. And I'm so glad we did this. And I would like to think that anyone that's enjoyed this episode will go and follow Scott at Sugar Daddy Scotty TV on Instagram. Instagram. And Daddy's with a Y. I E. Oh, no, he's with a Y. y. Yeah. And so Scotty's, Scotty's with, with an IE. IE. So Sugar Daddy with a Y, Scotty with an IE yeah. TV. Yeah. So that's where they can find you. Yeah. Although I do have to say this, and I'm just going to do a warning with yeah. that, oh. is sometimes <laughs> um, sometimes Scott's Instagram is a little bit hot. His stories can include a lot of bootay, yeah. a lot of shaking of the bootay. Not his, just I lovely. Both guys too. And, and guys, he does, he does quite artistic stuff, mm. but also he often changes his Instagram handle. So like oh, yeah. one minute you're there, the next no, minute you're this. gone. You're going to keep this one. I keep getting deleted too. So, oh, so he keeps getting deleted because get the same name. Yeah. So, so if you do follow him, the chances are that you'll lose him at some point. <laughs> well, I'm, I actually been very, I'm trying my best, but these days Instagram is so anal. I said, I hate my job or something like that. And they told me I was violating the guidelines. I was like, this, this oh. thing is crazy. You can't even say certain stuff. No, it is. It's heavily censored now. Yeah. Heavily censored. But, you know, if that's what, if you want to see what he's doing, do that. And hopefully we will do more of these. I mean, Scott is all the way from New York. but And I wanted him in the studio simply because the online stuff just doesn't, you can't get the energy as good. And there's always delays and Wi-Fi issues and so on. Of course. On. And that's so I was so grateful. Here. You you know, you coming here, um, especially to Northampton, because not only have you traveled from New York, yeah. you've traveled from London to Northampton. It's a two-hour train ride. Yeah. Here. yeah. So he's just he's just been it's on a mission me. to get here, and I really, really appreciate that. So I want to thank you, and I want to thank you for this episode, but I'm sure there's going to be more because we literally have we literally have covered like a, a fingerprint's worth of your life in yeah, this one I'm episode. Sorry. There's so much. Well, again, you can't be I'm sorry. I'm all over the place. We, no. <laughs> No, I am. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I'm all over the place. <laughs> Just you've done so much. It's impossible to cover it all yeah. in this episode. But I think we've touched on the beginnings and the ends of where you're at. We just need to fill in the details another time, no doubt. Yeah, whatever you want. Yeah, I'll fly back. I'll take a jet just to come see you. Then go back this home. is what I mean. He's so he's so fly. He just he just I yeah, wish. I'll be here. <laughs> mm, I, <wish. laughs> so, I did that for you. You know, I did it for Lionheart one time. Yeah, you, you, I must admit, you, uh, b- before we finish up, guys, I'm yeah. going to say this. Like, Scott is committed to the cause. If he, mm. if he sees what you're doing and likes you as a person, he's going to give you everything he's got because that's just who he is. A very generous man with your time. Oh, so I'm, I'm just, I'm just appreciating that. I mean, if you guys and uh, anybody who watches this is special because you know she's the boss, like Rick Ross, like, there's nothing greater. So Aww. and I do believe she's going to change the world for the better. And that's why she's needed. And I would encourage everybody to water her as much as possible, protect you as much as possible. Because you said it was three stabbings out here. So we got to make sure, you know, we slam anything that's coming in our way. Oh, you are so it's kind. For real, for real. I genuinely love you. Genuinely. Yeah, you too, gangster. Uh, well, guys, that's it from me and Scott. Bye-bye for now. Peace and love. <laughs>